Um, and I want to introduce Julie Blackhawk, uh, who is originally from Tayandanaga, Mohawks of the Bay of Kinte in southern Ontario. And she is Senior Counsel with Justice Canada's Aboriginal Law Centre in Ottawa. And she provides litigation support on Section 35 Aboriginal rights and title issues for litigation teams across the country. And she joined the department in 2000 as a litigator in the Vancouver Regional Office, where she worked on a variety of matters, including uh, the Prophet River uh, or Wolf Treaty 8 litigation, and also the Tsilkateen uh, Roger William trial litigation team. In addition, uh, she's worked in the specific claims branch on matters before former uh, Indian Claims Commission of Canada. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Amy, for that uh, kind introduction. And uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, come speak and share some perspectives from the Federal Crown. Um, the focus of my talk today is to highlight some of the implications of the two decisions, Grassy Narrows and Chilcotin, on Aboriginal rights and the management of natural resources from the perspective of the Federal Crown. Um, I'll start off with a brief overview of the two decisions. Of course, most of us know that in Chilcotin, the uh, Supreme Court declared for the first time an Aboriginal group had Aboriginal title to a defined area of land in Canada, and that both the federal and provincial uh, government could pass laws that applied to Aboriginal title lands and could infringe, provided that uh, we satisfy the justification test. The Crown is of the view that uh, the decisions do not substantially uh, expand or alter the existing law um, with respect to Aboriginal title. Rather, the court summarizes the principles uh, outlined in earlier jurisprudence, namely the test for Aboriginal title articulated by the Supreme Court of Canada in Delgamook, that to establish title, a claimant First Nation must establish sufficient occupation prior uh, to European sovereignty, where present occupation is relied on, continuity of occupation, and at the time of sovereignty, exclusive occupation. So none of this is new. Um, but the court does provide guidance um, with respect in particular to the sufficiency of occupation, the first element of the test. In particular, the court highlighted that in addition to the common law test for possession, um, the perspectives of the Aboriginal claimant groups and perspectives on occupation are particularly important. Accordingly, uh, First Nation land use patterns, natural boundaries, the carrying capacity of the land, um, evidence of seasonal rounds are examples of some of the kinds of evidence that may shed light on First Nation perspectives with respect to occupation at the relevant time periods. Contrary to the submissions of the Crown, both federal and uh, BC, the court held the occupation sufficient to ground title is not limited to small specific sites such as villages or burial sites. Rather, we now know that title may extend to larger, albeit still defined, tracts of land that were regularly and exclusively used by the First Nation claimant group. The court confirmed um, some elements of Aboriginal title, um, and specifically that Crown title is burdened by the pre-existing legal rights of Aboriginal people who used and occupied the land prior to European arrival and sovereignty, that Aboriginal title is a unique legal interest in land, and it confers onto Aboriginal collectives rights that are similar to, but not the same, as fee simple ownership. Those rights include a right to decide how land is used, use and enjoyment of the land, possession of the land, certain economic benefits that flow from those lands, and determination of the uses and management of those lands. However, Aboriginal title land can only be alienated to the Crown. It cannot be encumbered in ways that would deprive or prevent future generations from its use and enjoyment. And in that, the court went on to talk about the fact that Aboriginal title is a collective interest in land for the whole of the First Nation, both present and future generations. This links back to the discussion in Delgamook on the inherent limit 
um, and that while the court was careful to emphasize that uses of title lands are not limited to traditional or historical uses, the uses cannot be inconsistent with the group's particular attachment to the land. This could mean limits on the manner in which Aboriginal title lands can be developed, notwithstanding the fact that the court talked about it being an interest in land that includes the ability to determine the use and the management of the land. Um, in other words, will development to Aboriginal title lands be limited to certain sustainable development projects to, that do not result in permanent changes to the land? Um, where development that could result in a more significant permanent change that will be felt by future generations might, might not be permitted. So for example, could the group agree to or consent to um, hydroelectric flooding which presumably will damage the land into eternity? Um, that is an outstanding question and I think that's going to be the subject of debate as um, we grapple with how Aboriginal title lands will be managed future forward. <clears throat> what is clear um, is that once Aboriginal title is established, the Crown owes fiduciary duties to the collective when dealing with the lands. but we may encroach on Aboriginal title lands if consent is obtained or if it satisfies the justification test. What manner consent will take on is again an outstanding question and it links back to this inherent limit and the interests of the future generations. Who can provide that consent to develop lands that will have impacts or may have impacts on future generations use, enjoyment and benefits of title lands? From our perspective, the Chilcotin decision underscores the importance of the duty to consult. Clearly the court is or urging us to engage in discussions with First Nations who assert title claims. And as I confirmed with Heather earlier, there are title claims in every jurisdiction across the country. Prior to the establishment of title, the Crown has a procedural duty to consult with First Nations. Consultation we know must be meaningful and lies on a spectrum that must consider the proposed project, the potential impacts on the um, asserted rights, and the strength of the claim. And of course that can only really be understood through a process that is meaningful, conducted in good faith, and has willing partners on both sides to engage in a dialogue. We also know that prior to the establishment of title, provincial laws apply to Crown lands as they would ordinarily. After Aboriginal title is established, Crown activities uh, or the Crown must seek, sorry, consent of the Aboriginal title holders or they can proceed with particular activities if they satisfy the justification test. In Chilcotin, the court applies the infringement test in essentially the same manner as was articulated in earlier jurisprudence. Government action will be held to infringe if it meaningfully diminishes one of the characteristics or incidents of title. And as I discussed earlier, the right to occupy, possess, economic benefits, management for future generations. However, the court was clear that not all government action constitutes an infringement. And they suggested, for example, that certain environmental standards or regulations may not amount to an infringement of Aboriginal title because presumably Aboriginal people are also concerned about the environment just as everyone in Canada is and should be. Um, however, the manner of the dialogue perhaps needs to uh, consider Aboriginal perspectives a little bit more clearly because the legislation arguably does not account for that. But again, I will leave that for others to debate and decide. Um, to infringe Aboriginal title, a government must, dis must demonstrate that they have fully complied and discharged with their duty to consult. Assuming that hurdle can be met, 
Um, the second stage of the inquiry is, is the action supported by compelling and substantial government objectives? And here, the court emphasized the broader goal of reconciliation and that that requires a consideration of Aboriginal perspectives, um, interests and concerns, as well as the broader public interests. Assuming that element can be satisfied, the third element of the inquiry goes to proportionality. Is the action consist, uh, consistent with the objectives um, and consistent with the federal crown's fiduciary, or sorry, with the crown's fiduciary obligations to the group? Um, and that being the interest in present and future generations and the proportionality. So, is it connected to a? Is the proposal? rationally connected um, to the objectives, minimal impairment, and proportionality of those impacts. Since Dalgamook, consultation has been relevant to justification, but what is now clear is that this is the first or preliminary step that must be overcome before you get to the other elements of the justification test. Accordingly, the Crown will continue to focus on good faith consultation and development of consultation records as the decision underscores the importance of the duty to consult and how that can yield positive results. The court is clearly merging the Haida and consultation framework with the Sparrow justification framework. Is this a move towards a more uniform standard um, to assess the infringement of charter and section 35 rights? I, I think that it's clear that uh, you know we draw inspiration from the Section 1 analysis and uh, the courts are trying to make a more uniform test here. Um, what's less clear though is um, the kind of development that, Aboriginal, that could be justified um, to take place on Aboriginal title lands that is in keeping with the Crown's fiduciary duties. In, Ch in Chilcotin, the court noted that um, Incursions that would substantially deprive future generations of the benefit in land could not be justified. Yet in Dalgamook, the court notes that the activities like forestry, mining, hydroelectric development, and strip mining could be justified if there were broader public interests at stake. I think it's clear that the justification standard is higher now than was contemplated in Dalgamook, but it's unclear where the line is in terms of probably not a strip mine, but what would be justifiable. Again, I think that that can really only be determined through meaningful dialogue, and the consultation framework gives us a tool to use to get to that. Similarly, the proportionality element is difficult to comment on in the abstract, but it's clearly um, an essential element to factor, and the courts will certainly um, look at the proportionality versus the proposed or uh, anticipated benefits of a project when they're assessing a claim. Finally, and importantly from the Federal Crown perspective, is the court's confirmation that provincial laws of general application apply to Aboriginal title lands subject to the justification test, and that Interjurisdictional immunity no longer has a role to play in the context of Aboriginal rights. Where there is no competing federal legislation, the two relevant questions are, was the provincial legislation intended to apply, and if so, does it unjustifiably infringe title? This aspect of the decision, in our view, simplifies what has long been a, an area of uncertainty and an issue of profound concern for the provinces as Heather talked about earlier today. Turning now to the Grassy Narrows or Kiwaitan decision, the court was clear that Ontario alone has the ability to take up Treaty 3 lands and regulate in accordance with the treaty in Section 35, that no two-step process is required um, that necessitates federal supervision or, or approval of provincial takings ups. Again, in our view, this is consistent with earlier jurisprudence where the courts confirm that both levels of government, federal and provincial, owe duties to consult and that the treaty is an agreement between First Nations and the Crown. Again, this decision stresses the importance of the consultation um, and duty to consult framework, 
noting that the applicability of provincial legislation that affects treaty rights through the taking up is determined through consultation in Section 35. But again, provincial authority is not unconditional. The honour of the Crown governs provincial powers, as does the fiduciary obligations. While consultation and the importance of this duty is highlighted in both decisions, the Federal Crown is of the view that neither decision has changed the substantive law on consultation. This is not to say that the Crown, um, how the Crown will engage in consultation and the level of consultation has not been impacted. Clearly, these are important decisions and where Aboriginal title is asserted, the strength of claim will impact the level of Crown consultations. This, of course, is done on a case-by-case -case basis. In addition, Chilcotin underscores the importance of good faith consultations and the building of a comprehensive consultation record, particularly where we cannot reach consent. That said, in our view, the duty to consult is not a one-way street. In Bain v. Moulton Contracting, in our opinion, the courts stressed the reciprocal nature of the duty to consult. That consultation must be conducted in good faith on both sides. And the court notes that First Nations must seek remedies through processes such as proceedings before the court. In our view, where reasonable accommodation measures are offered and rejected, or where First Nations continue to assert but never actually make a claim for final resolution of their, claim, of their claim through a court or other negotiated processes, they can, First Nations should not be permitted to continually use that as a red flag for development. But when will it be reasonable to expect a claim to have been filed or the timing of those negotiations is an outstanding issue. Clearly, it took 20, more than 20 years to resolve Chilcotin. I'm, I'm not sure how long it took uh, to resolve Kiwaitin, but all this to say, we know that this takes time. But we also don't believe that First Nations should be permitted to, for lack of a better term, sit on their rights forever, but continue to just <coughs> assert claims. <coughs> With respect to accommodation, again, in our view, no new law was created, but the courts have emphasized in these decisions that accommodation cannot be excluded from the outset of any consultation process, the importance of assessing straight st strength of claim, and how this can guide what accommodations are required and what accommodation measures are reasonable in the circumstances and responsive to First Nation concerns with respect to potential adverse impacts. In our view, accommodation measures appear to fall into three broad but not watertight compartments, that is avoidance, mitigation, and offset. But a combination of those measures um, may be appropriate depending on the nature of the interest and the potential impacts. As well, it's not always the federal crown that is responsible for providing those measures. For example, we know that IBAs are frequently negotiated between proponents and the First Nation, not the Crown. The other interesting uh, element of the decision from the, from the Crown's perspective is that the court comments a little bit um, in Chilcotin on transition issues. So prior to the establishment of Aboriginal title, the Crown owes a procedural duty to consult and, if appropriate, accommodate. Failure to discharge this duty could result in a variety of remedies, including injunctive relief, damages, or an order to carry out properly the obligation to consult. Um, after Aboriginal title is established, if the Crown cannot secure consent, and if it fails to satisfy the justification test, again, usual remedies are available, such as damages or injunction orders. But what is noteworthy is in Chilcotin, the court notes that once title is established, the Crown may need to reassess prior conduct. What the practical implications of this are still very uh, unclear. However, um, the Crown is of the view that if we have properly discharged our duty to consult 
and have made reasonable accommodation measures prior to the establishment of title, this will be something that the court will have to contend and grapple with going forward. Um, because again, our view is that development um, and other projects that are for the benefit of all Canadians shouldn't be stymied while we continue to wrestle with some of these questions. But what that balance is, again, will have to be determined in other cases and by others smarter than me. Um, finally, I'll just um, talk a little bit about um, negotiation processes. So after Chilcotin, um, it's clear that uh, it's necessary and important to factor in Aboriginal title claims and assess the strength of those claims and factor that into operations and proposed operations of government. But um, the viability of the rights neutral process has been seriously put into question and First Nations have made it clear that processes where rights are not discussed um, are not sustainable. In our view, negotiation is still the preferred option. Um, because of the savings of cost and time, and also because it leads to a more palatable result for both parties. Um, the quantum of land is an issue that nobody de tends to have satisfaction with at the end of the day. Indeed, in Chilcotin, they were originally seeking an order for title over a much larger area of land than they asked for, and of course we know the Crown was asking for significantly less. page here. <laughs> so where does that leave us? On July 28th, Canada announced some further action to advance treaty negotiations and reconciliation in response to the report prepared by Douglas Eiford, the Special Representative on West Coast Energy and Infrastructure. Some of the announcements that we made were that we were prepared to, to uh, negotiate incremental and non-treaty agreements, engage on ex existing guidelines on consultation for federal officials, and new guidance for industry, particularly with respect to the clarity of roles and responsibilities to enter into more consultation protocols with Aboriginal groups in key priority areas, such as where proposed resource development is planned. Resuming fisheries negotiations in BC that were put on hold pending the Cohen inquiry and clarifying Canada's approach to resolve, resolving shared territorial disputes in the context of resource development. That isn't a, that isn't, um, a response to these two decisions, and we know that. Um, in addition, Ms. Minister Valcour has appointed Douglas Eiford again as a special ministerial representative to lead engagement with Aboriginal groups and key stakeholders to renew and reform the comprehensive land claims policy. Those engagements are going on right now and we are expecting a report with recommendations in January of 2015. How government will act on those recommendations and how it will dovetail with um, the announcements made in July to try and strengthen and renew processes uh, is an outstanding question and we'll see how things move forward going ahead. But all this to say we are taking the decisions seriously and, um, and uh, we, we do see and uh, appreciate the importance of consultation in the context of managing resource development going forward. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, some time for questions here. We have a, where's the other mic? Oh, Jason's got the other mic. We'll go to, um, that's how, is it Peter? Right there, Jason. Okay, I'm just drawing in my, taking my IOU from before uh, lunch, so it really related to the discussion um, prior to lunch and the discussion involving Ovid and others about um, the shortcomings of the Canadian legal system as it 
uh, applies in Aboriginal issues. I spent a long time arguing that very point. The problem, of course, is that the judges are never going to admit that they're functus on this, uh, on this issue. And um, although people are suggesting, well, there might be other tribunals possible, well, we've tried that, it seems to me, in the past, that are still trying it with specific claims and uh, comprehensive claims. It takes a long time to put together, and there seems to always be some problem. And the problem is, one of the problems is, that those entities are created by the federal crown, usually, uh, under federal le legislation. So once again, uh, the crown decides what the rules of the game are, what the entity is. So I am just saying uh, that perhaps we should be looking outside of the state of Canada, and I'm of course referring to international law. And I'm not sure um, why there wouldn't be more concentration on seeing how international remedies might assist First Nations taking on the state. The advantage, of course, being that you're now dealing with a body of law independent of the state. It's not the state's law. It's not the state's entities, state's uh, courts that are deciding it's something else. We have it, uh, we've had experience in bringing uh, applications before the Inter-American uh, <coughs> Committees on Human Rights and the UN Committee on Human Rights. It's not an easy matter. In both cases, however, we got past admissibility. So this first hurdle, uh, which is fought very hard by the Federal Crown, uh, first hurdle being that you get into at least the substantive rights. And my experience is in that uh, field that the Federal Crown will fight to the death, quite literally, um, to defend, well, first of all, to keep you out of that process so that there is no admissibility found. And God forbid, if they succeed, if they don't succeed in keeping you out, well, then they're going to uh, kill you with multiple, multiple submissions over and over again. But I do say that that's a good sign because they're taking it, the crowd is taking it seriously and is taking it seriously because God forbid that there should be an instance, uh, an authority over and above the state, the crown, that makes a decision. It's an imperfect system. Uh, needs lots of work, but perhaps we should at least consider, rather than spending a lot of time and energy and effort on new entities, which will be entities, the creation of the crown, to uh, something that already exists and, as we know, is evolving rapidly. Indigenous law, indigenous rights under international law is evolving rapidly. And, uh, but it's not going to evolve, evolve unless indigenous peoples get in there and fight and continue to value it as a source uh, of recourse for their complaints against the state. So I just wanted to mention that as a, another possibility other than the courts. My name is Paul McNeil. Uh, Heather, a question with respect to the map that you presented as part of the ruling. I'm assuming that historically the boundaries for the First Nation were not precise. They would be sort of soft edges. Um, was part of the court case actually clearly defining through a survey those boundaries, or is there a second stage yet to come following the decision to uh, identify where those boundaries are, and is there more negotiation that will result uh, from that process? Thank you for that question. It's a really good question. Um, the, the origins of the claim area, so as I mentioned, the uh, Silkatine territory is much, much broader um, than the, the claim area. Um, the first action was started as a defensive measure um, in the face of a, an application, a commercial logging license. Um, now, that was 1980. <laughs> 
89 uh, was when that action was filed. So if we think the Patriots in the Constitution, Section 35 is 1982, you know, we're really at early stages of the development of the law. Um, and they brought it as a, tra as a trapping rights, an Aboriginal trapping rights case, just for those, that trap line territory. Um, then um, in 1998, the Brittany Triangle was added. Um, and the two actions were consolidated um, into a claim for Aboriginal title and trapping rights because by then we had Delgamook. Um, this is long before my time, by the way. Um, so the, 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 the claim area was sort of an accident of history and how the whole thing got pled, and it was kind of in response to, at the front of our mind was this decision in Chislada, um, which said, you know, you can't bring, um, a, you can't ask for a declaration of rights and title, rights or title in the abstract, it has to be in relation to a particular threat. So we were, we were br bringing, or the plaintiff was bringing the action in relation to that particular threat of clear-cut logging. Um, in terms of what Justice Vickers actually, where he actually um, delineated the, the boundaries, um, he didn't include that map in his, in his trial uh, judgment. He sort of described it in words. Um, that was something that the plaintiff's legal team, you know, we, we, we tried to, to show on a map where, where exactly that was, and the Supreme Court of Canada adopted that map and put it in their judgment. But you know, in my other life, I'm a solicitor and I do, you know, on reserve commercial leasing and stuff like that, and I have that exact question. It's like, well, okay, this isn't a survey, so it's this, it's this, you know, how precise are those boundaries? And to be honest, um, I haven't been involved in that implementation side, uh, so I don't know um, what, what will happen about that, but presumably there will need to be a survey. It'll need to be known with some precision. Whether that gets registered in the land title office, I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to those questions. Does that help? Yeah. I guess what I can say is I can add that I, I have been part of the team that's been discussing with BC how to move forward with oh, this. Perfect. And one of the questions that we have is what are the boundaries? And we have a slightly different interpretation. Uh, you know, um, Heather was saying approximately 2,000 kilometers. We're saying approximately 1,750 square kilometers. So this clearly will be an issue for further discussion and debate amongst the Chilcotin National Government. Bonjour. Bill Forbes, Indigenous Cuts. I'm from Grassy Narrows. Sitting here all morning, I hear a lot about talking about the First Nations. And I happen to be one of the, uh, the, the First Nations from Grassy Narrows. I, I'm a band counselor for my community, and I'm, I want to follow up these discussions. See, that's the very thing that we face every day in our community. People come in with, with English words. And then people like myself, I'm fortunate that I can speak a little bit of both. But some of our First Nation back home only speak Nishinaabemwe. Then we have to go back and try to translate on what is being said here. The area that you're talking about, this is the very thing that we're, we're, we're dealing with today. They talk about tra traditional territories or native lands. I heard today uh, uh, First Nation lands. Does that mean that little reserve we have or the one off reserve that Crown claims to have that we sold to him, that he claims. There's a lot of trappers in, the, in my community as well, too. In that very area that we're trying to protect, consists of about 2,000 2, square miles. That's an area that, that's within a treaty tree territory, consists of 55,000 square miles. So I'm just wondering, that new ruling now that has taken place, does that mean the province, well, both governments, will just move forward and claim 
whatever they want without talking to us. Like you talk about consultation and accommodation. Tomatoes are big words. I have to define them in our language so there are people who understand what they mean. And uh, I'm very concerned, especially for my future generations. We got to make it good for them that it'll be a lifelong process of what we're dealing with today with these court systems. I, I agree with Ovid when he said that we have to get together as a community, as First Nations across Canada. There are 633 First Nations in Canada. We have to band together and have a one voice to be able to fight this Goliath, I call him. We're just like little David. But in that very sense too, David defeated Goliath. So that's my hope and dreams today. So I was just wondering, does that mean the province will take whatever they want or is that isolated where they cannot go there without asking the First Nations? Well, I, I can't speak for what the province will or will not do, but I think what's clear from the decisions is that the province, while they have the authority to take up, it's in consultation, so they have to have dialogue with the communities that are affected to consider what the impacts of that taking up will be, how that will impact treaty rights, Aboriginal rights that are asserted, and you know, um, depending on the strength of those claims and, and the assessment of the strength of those claims, make reasonable accommodations. If those can't be reached, then we're into a, a framework where the Crown will have to justify the infringement. I just, I don't have a lot to add other than to say miigwech, um, Councillor, um, for your words. And I think there is a, a lot of work to be done. One thing I... I would have liked to have spoken about at this this treaty at, at this um, conference is, you know, there's a real there's an argument. I think others will be speaking about this, but there's an argument to be made that the, this two pair of decisions um, really gives a lot of tools to uh, non-treaty First Nations, um, but it doesn't give the same tools to treaty First Nations, and so that creates a bit of a like a double standard. Um, which is a real problem. So from my perspective, there is a lot of work to be done um, among Treaty First Nations. And, you know, I'm a lawyer, so I only have one piece of the puzzle. But I, I think that, like I said in my, in my presentation, the trial decision in Silkotine has some really good kernels that, in my view, like just looking at it as a, as a, a lawyer acting for First Nations, should be seized upon by communities like Grassiniers, like Treaty 3 and uh, the other Treaty First Nations to hold the Crown to that standard and say, you haven't, you haven't inquired, you haven't taken an interest even in what our needs are. Therefore, the very fact that you haven't even done that means automatically, um, you know, you've, you, 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 you can't justify what you're doing and to hold them to that standard of developing su that sufficient, credible information to even know what the impact on your rights will be. I, I had a quick question. How, how did the Silkutine pay for all of the mapping and all of, all of the legal argument? We got an advance cost order. So the court ordered um, the defendants to pay our pa partial part of our costs in advance. So we, yeah, we ran the ca the case um, on the basis of uh, the, the advance cost order. Uh, yeah, I think we have time for one. Yeah, we got time for a couple more. Right? We're good to. Uh, one one uh, one other question I wanted to ask. Uh, well, the Michigan people are very unique in my uh, description of my people. Uh, we don't have 
Indian Act Chief and Council uh, election. We, we have four council system. Uh, we develop our own laws on election law. Okay, that's one of them. So you keep saying First Nations was basically, in our view, they're basically another name for Indian bands. To us, anyway, that's because uh, the reason why I said because in where we come from, Ovid knows that. They call themselves Mr. Sinik, eh, Mr. Paistikuk, uh, and some other people call themselves OCN. And we looked at it and we say, there's still bans under the Indian Act. So what we did, this is where I come coming into consultation and uh, accommodation, so, like that. so because we're not, because our leadership are not elected under the Indian Act, so my question is, where does Pibitzikamak fit in this consultation and accommodation? Because we're not in that, in that category of what you guys have just been saying. In our uh, processes, because the province, Manitoba Hydro, which Ovid knows very well too, the accommodation keeps going back to the band. Okay. And they, they say Cross Lake First Nation, okay? But we said, no, if you go there, you won't find chief and council at all, okay? So, so we, we're struggling trying to understand who is being consulted here, the people or the Indian Act band members which basically tell your, your, your court says they're still the same people with a territory. Okay, so my question now is this. What is your view then, who is to be consulted? The people or a regime that was developed by federal government which doesn't fit under the section 35 one at all? So that's my question. <laughs> I'm dying to answer that question. <laughs> um, Section 35, constitutional, Aboriginal, title Aboriginal rights, treaty rights are held uh, collectively by the Aboriginal group um, as defined by Indigenous law. Um, and... <laughs> So we dealt with this issue, I mean, like, it's pretty silly that we even had to deal with this issue, but, you know, we, the, the Crowns in, in the Silcotine case fought us tooth and nail that the Silcotine Nation was, a, was the Aboriginal group that held the title interest. They said, no, 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 you know, it's the bands or whatever. And um, so the plaintiff argued, no, it's the nation. And even though there was no... Um, like um, corporation or <laughs> band or whatever that you could point to to say that is the governing body of the Silcotine Nation. The court nevertheless found, um, and on the basis of, of oral history evidence, the elders themselves saying, as well as experts who said, no, 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 there, it wasn't the way they were organized, they didn't have one leader. You know, they were a collective, they shared a territory, they shared a language, uh, they are a nation. Just because it doesn't conform to what, you know, <coughs> Europeans think of as a nation state with a president or a prime minister or whatever, doesn't matter, they're still a nation. So I think that was a really important affirmation by the court that, yeah, um, co those collective Section 35 rights are not... Um, are not held necessarily by Indian Act bans. However, I will caution you that in my experience in um, the consultation accommodation framework, um, companies and governments are much more comfortable, you know, dealing with Indian Act bans. Um, and so that, that, can, that can result in some serious tension, especially where you have two parallel, like on the, on, the, on the coast, like where I'm from in BC, you've got a hereditary leadership structure. Um, you also have an Indian Act band, that's, uh, band council that's been in, like plunked down on top. And you know, both of those operate at the same time. So 
you know, the tendency is for the governments and the companies to just go to the chief and council. Um, but I would say from a strict legal um, perspective, that is not the correct uh, group to be consulting with. And not necessarily. It might be, but not, not always. Yeah, I'll just jump in to say that that is a, uh, the practical realities of it does become a bit of a muddying factor in all of this because indeed in a lot of instances it's a, a particular chief or, or council member as a representative of the interests of whoever, band X or nation X, um, and it's it's not always clear who's speaking or who's representing adequately adequately the group and and it is a it, it is a difficult question it's it's something that governments and industry struggle with as well as first nations um, band councils and and their their representatives yeah sorry i'll just make one more point i will qualify that to say i think there is some onus on the first nation to take a position as to who the collective is and who is authorized to speak on behalf of the collective. You know, in the case of the Silcotine, it was, it was pretty clear that the uh, Silcotine national government sort of had that authority in the present day. So, um, yeah, it, th there can't be sort of a, a vacuum where the First Nation says, it's not the chief and council, but, you know, there isn't, so there has to be a collective understanding um, from the Aboriginal group itself, and that's where you know developing that internal governance um, is so important because it enables you to position yourself effectively in, in communications with the Crown by defining yourself not by the Indian Act structure, Act structure. If you're not defining yourself that way, then there is an onus, I think, on the First Nation to say, well, okay, who are we and what are our governance structures and to educate the companies and government governments about that. Okay, we're going to go to Elder uh, Elmer Kershane, and then time for you to back to the same. Bonjour, nous sommes en train de dire que nous avons une indigène case, mais que si nous sommes en train de parler. I've been listening here all morning. And I've been battling this issue for years. As I grew up and I listened to the history of my ancestors and what I've learned, Creator put us here on this land. We are the ownership of this land. Our ancestors signed an agreement with the foreigner that came across to live in peace and harmony. Somehow, it got twisted. Somehow, greed came in and manipulated not only us, but also the foreigner that came across. Now we're sitting here trying to debate which is the right way to go about everything. I've been listening to this history for years and years. You know, it gets tiresome after a while. It's the same old thing over and over. The way that I've learned it, I am the first government of this country. We are the first government of this country. We are the first people of this country. But that's never been honored. We signed an agreement to work and to live side by side. What happened to that agreement? Yes, we have all responsibilities. And that responsibility is for the future for each and every one of us. But somehow, we're playing games with ourselves, trying to claim ownership, trying to claim kingship. Why? Where is the family concept of the wampum belt that was mentioned a while ago? 
this morning. I will govern my people the way they want to be governed. You'll govern yours the way you want to govern yours. What happened to that? To live side by side. You know, I'm going to be bold and I'm not going to be afraid. This is our land. Lock, stock, and barrel. And I'm quoting one old chief from BC. Maybe you always remembers him. You know, here today, we're debating about all these questions. Here we're trying to find some justification to bring some understanding. In the meantime, while Troal we're trying to bring justice, our present government is selling our resources to the other side of the world. What are we going to have left after other people have control of everything and we don't have nothing? Have you ever thought about that? Think about it hard. Because if you're going to leave a food table for your family and my family, we better start to think, think heavy. This land was given to us to cherish and to share with other people. We better start understanding what is sharing is, what is respect is. We better start doing that. If we don't, we'll be sitting here and I'll be singing from up above, still listening to the same story. Thank you.